God who was and is and is to come. God who was and is to come, the power of the risen one, he's the God who brings, the God who brings the dead to life, you're the God of miracles, what once was dead is now alive, I proclaim it this morning, the God who was and is to come. power of the risen one, the God that brings the dead to life, you're the God of miracles, you're the God of miracles, God was really good, Jesus was really good at bringing things back to life, and he still does it today, I'm not just talking about physically, I'm talking about those dreams that you once had, those visions that you once had, those thoughts that you once had, those desires that you once had to serve him, all those things that were once alive but are now dead, I proclaim it right now in the name of Jesus. He's going to bring those back to life in you like never before. And there's going to be a fire that raises up in you like never before this morning. And you're going to want to serve him with a passion unlike any that has ever burned before you before. Amen. Mm, yeah, yeah. God who was and is to come. Oh, the power, the power of the risen one. The God who brings, the God who brings the dead to life. You're the God of miracles. You're the God of miracles. The God who was and is. Come on. God who was and is. not go back to the same seat and uh, those of you that are up here if, if you can deal with the, the attention uh, I would like for you to move to a different seat but everyone that came for your miracle you're not going to leave this place like you came this morning and that, that chair you sat in ain't good enough for you anymore you're going to have to move to a new you're in a new place you're in a new place with the Lord so if you want to stay and pray, you stay and pray while I preach. The rest of you get on back and find you a new place to sit. I tell you, I'm sitting in a new place today. I'm sitting in a new place. The Lord has, uh, I guess he began to do a work even yesterday and just, uh, I didn't realize totally what was going on, but I just, I mean, I've always loved you, and I've always loved people, loved my family. But my love is more intense than ever. 
I mean, I'm really understanding, loving. I've always loved my grandbabies and my wife, my family. I, I can love to the place my heart hurts. And when I'm able to love you till my heart hurts, then that's, a, that's an awesome thing. And that's where I'm at. And I, uh, you know, I got a miracle up here today. Um, I have had, and you know how sometimes you, things are going on in your life and they go on for so li- long that you don't realize you have them or you forget or you get so used to it. But I have had a weight on my spirit. A weight on my spirit. But it's gone today. I mean, I've been carrying around a weight on my spirit. And uh, anybody that's tried to serve the Lord for any length of time understands there's a spiritual battle that, that goes on. There's a reason the Bible talks about the, the, the spirit of heaviness. Because the battle that we fight, there's a heaviness. But I want to minister today, and uh, you all are in luck today. Praise and worship's gone on a little longer. God's done some awesome things. And I'm going to preach the whole book of Revelation. <laughs> but actually, if you, if you look at the back of your bulletin, the title of today's message is Three Steps to Comprehending the Ending. And I've gone from Revelation 1 all through Revelation 22. But what I, what I had done, and I've got to get the first point in today, but, uh, and I was going to preach this, uh, but what I, I had, the Lord had laid on my spirit is, uh, you know, revelations can be intimidating to people. But there's three things that the Holy Spirit raised up in me about the book of Revelations that just makes it so easy to comprehend. And I, that, and I focus on these three things. And this may not be for everybody today, and it may be more for me than most of you, but I want to share and uh, the, the things that I focus on that makes Revelation comprehensive. And these will always be a part of Revelation with anybody that you're talking to and you're ministering to. And I really just want to focus on on the first point today. But... Leading up to that, I, I want to tell you another reason why this is an important book to preach. Because John the Revelator says that God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. I get a blessing. Say amen, somebody. I'm getting a blessing for reading to you today out of the book of Revelation. Now this ought to really excite you. And he blesses all who listen to this message and obeys what it says, for the time is near. Now clap for yourselves, because you're going to get a blessing. How many of you already got a blessing? Well, my eyes are all messed up today. Blinded one, can't see out of the other. So I'm going to have to really trust the Holy Spirit But this message uh, really begins as God's word through John. Here's John, the revelator. And he's on the Isle of Patmos, and he is within viewing distance of seven churches. And this revelation is really for the church, so we'll know what to look for. We'll, We'll watch, we'll wait, we'll have hope. And the churches he's ministering to, there's seven churches, and they represent churches that literally existed in John the Revelator's day. They represent, now, you know, Bible scholars smarter than me. I don't know whether this is right or not, but they say it also represents the dispensations of churches through the years. Well, maybe. But I do know that it reflects the spirit of churches today. And you know, one of the things that gives me pause for concern, only one of the seven churches was ready to meet Jesus. I wonder if only one of seven believers is ready to meet Jesus. You know, the statistics are going down. Even the secular world acknowledges where the rate ratio used to be 60, 65% of uh, America were, was faith-based, believed in Christ. 
We're so-called Christians. I mean, I'm hearing as low as 20%, 40%. So I wonder if one in seven are really where they need to be with the Lord. If not, some of us got some work to do. I'm your pastor. I got some work to do. God did some work this morning. I'm telling you, he did some work. He did some work. You know, what, what happened today is God saying, this is just the tip of the iceberg cross connection. But some of you need a miracle. Some of you need to look at things a different way. Some of you need to be shaken. Because before I can bless and just dump it out on you, you've got to be a receptacle for that. And you've got to be a good steward of that. I believe with all of my heart what today was was God affirming us. I believe he's validating our little church. And he's saying, you, I want you to be one. And you know what? The, found, the, the base foundation here is love and acceptance. We don't, we don't care what you drag in here. We don't care who you are, where you've been, your social place. That is just a spirit in this church that we're going to love you regardless. Love always gets God's attention because he is love. That's what he understands. We're not superficial. We don't put on airs. We don't try to, I'm saying from the top on down, we don't try to be something we're not. We just want to take who we are and what we are, give it to God and try to love people. But this is a message to the church. And so um, let me read a little bit of this. This, I need, I need more Kleenex over here. And you all stay out of my Kleenexes next time. But. That's the pastor's Kleenexes over there. I got one. Y'all, y'all can, whoever got one of my Kleenexes next Sunday, drop them in the offering basket. We'll collect them. At, I'll let my ushers count them to make sure we got all of them. Well, we get into Revelation just real quick. Like I said, I'm just going to try to get through one, one part today. I may not even do that. Uh, but Revelation begins with chapter 1. It's like an, the opening vision. I mean, it, it starts things rolling. It gets us, it sets things up. Uh, there's a letter to the seven churches. You know, I touched on that a little bit. Um, the, uh, there's a vision of the Lamb of God. Um, we read there's the seals are open. Uh, seals are something that's kept closed. The judgments are so terrible for the last days that, that uh, God has kept them closed. Christ opens them. We see the seven seals. The seven seals usher in seven trumpets. Seven trumpets are things you see and you hear. Ain't nobody trying to hide none of that. Once it starts going, there's some things so terrible that, you know, God's not ready to lay that on mankind right now. But once the ball starts rolling, and then we see a, a vision on earth and heaven, we see conflict. That's chapter 12 through chapter 14, chapter 15 through 16. Then... We get big old bowl, like big salad bowls of judgment is dumped out on the world. And then the world, um, the, the, the state of the world, the apostate church, the secular governments of the world, all the things, the kings that are worshiping the Antichrist, they are judged. And then we see in chapter 20 through chapter 22, we look at the end of the age and what's going to happen when we get through all this now we believe in the rapture now there may be some of you that don't some think that the church you and i are going to go through the tribulation and the conflict and the trials and you know a lot of believers don't want to read revelation because they think they got to deal with all that well i you know if you believe that i'll pray for you in heaven and, and, and wish you the best but I plan to be raptured up. Now, there's a lot of conflict. People may want to argue with you about this. So I want to give you just three points that why I believe, why I know there's going to be a rapture. Okay, first of all, the Holy the Spirit reveals to John the Revelator what's going on with the churches. There is the church age, the seven churches. If you notice, I believe it's the beginning of chapter 4 when the church age is dealt with there's a voice that says john the revelator you come on up to heaven come on big boy he's taken up and then from heaven 
Jesus shows him what's going on on the earth from heaven, not from the earth. He's called up, he says, come on up. We read about and we know that as a church, as believers, the true church is not appointed unto wrath. We're not appointed unto judgment and tribulation. We know that Revelation, when it gets to the judgment place, is for Israel to bring them back, and it judges Babylon, which is an apostate government, an apostate church. It's basically sin is judged. We're the church. We're not judged for sin. We're rewarded for faithfulness. So I know because John's called up as an example of the church, I know because we're not appointed unto wrath. And then finally, in the last battle, the Bible says that Christ will return with his armies dressed in white linen and riding on white horses. Well, if we weren't raptured to be in heaven, we could not come back from heaven to deal with sin and the enemy on earth. Now, some people want to argue, well, that's angels coming back. Angels don't need to ride no horses. Angels are never referred to as wearing white linen. We wear the robes of white. If you want further proof of that, that it's got to be white linen, we also read that this prostitute, the spirit of apostasy in Babylon, that God judges and punishes is wearing linen of scarlet. And the Bible says the kings of the earth will be caught up in Babylon, the spirit of Antichrist. So if men and women and kings of the earth are represented as wearing scarlet linen, which represents prostitution and sin, well, it only makes sense that the church would be described as wearing white linen. Because I'll say amen. amen. Okay, so we have three proofs and three reasons that we're going up in the rapture. So tell your friend they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> but if they want to stay, you'll pack them a lunch before you go. <laughs> but this is really what I want to talk about if I, if I can take a few more minutes. There's three things, three steps to comprehending the ending. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 1, reads like this. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John who faithfully reported everything he saw. This is the report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of the prophecy to the church and he blesses all who listens to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. Okay, the first thing is this revelation is the Savior revealed. Revelation is proving Christ to us. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ from God to show that events will suddenly take place. How, do you, how many of you understand and know that we live in a culture of suddenly? Things happen suddenly. This morning, I had no idea what God was going to do. I'm always open to what God's going to do, but what happened happened suddenly. It came on me suddenly. I was standing there and trying to remember what I was going to preach today because I left my bulletin up in the office. And suddenly, the Spirit said, there are people battling in this place. They have brought conflict into this place. I mean, everything about them, their life, their faith, some of them their soul, hangs in the balance. It's a battle they've been waging for a long time, and I want, them, I want to see them win the battle today. That was what, suddenly that came on me. Now we see in the world, Pearl Harbor, for those of you historically that know, you know, we have kids that they, have, they think it's a necklace. <laughs> but Pearl Harbor happened suddenly. And you know what the problem was? Just like the church, America wasn't prepared for Pearl Harbor. America was caught sleeping. America ignored the warnings. Listen to this. America had the weapons to win. But he couldn't deploy them in time. Child of God, you have got the weapons to win. 
but can you get them out of the airplane hangar? Wait, Lord, i got to show you, the enemy's attacking, I need a miracle. Uh, let me go find my Bible and I'll read it. Uh, uh, let me pray, let me call somebody and pray for them. Let me g Give me just one more Sunday to get back in church. My miracle, my weapon, it's in the hangar, God. Let me do what i got to do to get gas in it so I can get my miracle. Come on, somebody. So we're in that situation where God's wanting to do an awesome miracle on our behalf, but things happen suddenly. Mount St. Helens, suddenly. A lot of us are like that volcano. It's set for years and years. You know, we hear things all the time. You know, we got one of the greatest fault lines in the world that runs through Dahlonega, Georgia. We keep hearing how there's a fault, the St. Andreas Fault. California could break off into the ocean. Oh, we can only hope. No, I'm kidding. I wouldn't want people to get, I wouldn't want anybody to get hurt. But we've got, we've got volcano, we've got things that are just simmering, waiting to erupt. You know, we've got that in churches. We've got marriages just about to erupt. We've got kids that are just so stressed out and, you know, haven't been taught discipline and faith, and they're about to just go, you know, um, there, there's more kids doing mass shootings than adults. So we, it, it, they happen suddenly. You know, suddenly things Come on us, we just react. Suddenly, 9-11. You've got an enemy that's flying in on your landing strip. You've got an enemy that's trying to fly into your strength, fly into your faith, and totally destroy everything that you've believed in, everything you are, everything you've done. Suddenly. A faithful child of God is always prepared for suddenly. There's no reason that the United States of America should have lost the Battle of Pearl Harbor. They were superior weaponry. They were more technically sound. But they weren't focused. They weren't sharp. They were lazy. They took things for granted. Took their focus off the things that they ought to have been focused on. The Savior is revealed. Boom, he's revealed here in Revelation. Suddenly he's revealed. One of the cool things about Revelation, he's the Savior's revealed. He's coming back. But after that, through the whole passage, through the whole book of Revelation, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb 28 times. He's the Lamb. 28 times he's revealed. He's revealed as a Lamb. Not the same Lamb, but he's a Lamb. He was chosen to willingly die. He was that lamb that was led to slaughter. He was that lamb that was meek and he was lowly. But then something changed. We read in Revelation, the Savior is really revealed for who the Savior is. We read in chapter 5, he's in the throne room as the righteous judge. He's revealed. He's the one not coming to die. He's coming to open judgment. He's opening judgment upon the world. He's the righteous judge. And then he's given a crown in chapter 6. He's given a crown. He's king. He's conqueror. He comes in and he's going to take care of the sin. The Bible says that mountains are going to crumble and fall. He's not going to go to a mountain and a, a transfiguration. He's not going to go to the mountain to weep and pray. He's going to the mountain to watch it fall and crumble at his feet. He's a different lamb. He's revealed as someone that's not meek and lowly, but someone that's powerful and strong. In chapter 7, he greets the saints and the multitude. They come to worship him. That are made white by the blood of the lamb. And the Bible says it's one that's an awesome judge. This one that is a great conqueror that wears many crowns, that he's going to take the time to wipe the tears from our eyes. He's revealed, strong and powerful, yet for the child of God, he's gentle and he's loving. The pre cross lamb allowed himself to be mocked and scorned made fun of 
and abused. And I was thinking about that, and I was reminded of myself at a presbyter meeting. And this was a few months back. We were in the meeting, and a, a young pastor come in with his wife, and he was struggling in his ministry, not because of anything he had done spiritually or ethically, but he was dying of cancer. And he came in just to, so we could encourage him and he could let us know what was going on. He come in with his little wife and began to talk about the great things that God was doing in spite of his cancer. So we were going to have prayer. We in the, the press we were, we were directing questions to him and encouraging him. And when it got past that, and we were going to go on to the next step, I was just quickened in my spirit for that little wife that was standing there. And I, I, I can't hardly talk about it now because there's something, I get emotional. Because I was, you know, we, we were all these presbyters in that room, all the district leadership, everybody trying to be strong. And I was broken. And I said, sweetheart, what about you? How are you doing? And she just began to weep and try to explain how she, a wife that loves her husband, is coping with her husband and pastor that's loving the Lord and being obedient to the call and dying of cancer. Well, I just, I was a wreck. I just began to weep. I messed up the whole thing that day. I messed up the whole presbyter meeting. And I said, can we just come and pray with you? And she said, I would love that. And we just gathered around her, just broken, weeping, just loving on them. Now, he's still preaching. I believe God did a work. I, I'm trusting that God's healed, healed that little pastor. But after they left, we sat down and we started dealing with business. And there was a church, and the pastor had just done something absolutely. He was bringing a bad name to our denomination, bad name to the church, and we're talking. And I said, uh, Superintendent Rick, I think we just, I think we we got to deal with it. We can't set a precedent for letting people do things that are going to bring a bad name to the church. And, I mean, I was, I was ready to deal with it, and he kind of made a joke out of it. He said, what has happened to you, Joe? He said, uh, you know, one minute you're crying, and the next minute you want to bring this bread on the carpet. He said, and before you were crying, and my response was, well, I'm over that now. <laughs> and this is what I want to say to you. Pre-revelation Jesus, pre-cross Jesus, was meek and lowly, despised, ridiculed by the world. But he's over that now. <laughs> he's over that now. He's coming back and he's going to take authority over the things of this life and world. You're not going to see the church pushed around. He's not going to be put. People won't be laughing at the cross and the blood and salvation and Calvary when he comes back. Jesus is revealed. He's over that meat lamb business. Revelation says he's coming to take us home by force. He's coming to take authority. He's revealed in Revelation. He's, he came because that was, that was his calling for that season. That was the, the job, the work that the Father had for him. But he greets the saints. Worship. We worship him. We're made white by the blood of the Lamb. And then in that same passage... The Bible says, write these things down, three keys to victory, just real quick. They overcame Satan, three keys to victory. We overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. See, you know what I did just a few minutes ago, church? I testified. I testified. I was real and honest, and I, I shared from my heart what God did for me. Now that could have set somebody free. What God did for me could have set you free. By the word of my, what am I doing? I'm confirming the revelation of Jesus Christ. Who He's a deliverer. I mean, he's the worthy lamb, but church, he's the deliverer. He can deliver you. By the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and then it goes on to say, we don't want to talk about this a whole lot, but the, the third key to victory here is that we love him unto death. We love him. We love him. And that's one of the miracles in me. He's given me a little bit of the scope 
of his love in my heart. That's a miracle to get a little bit of the love of God. All of the love of God, your heart would explode. But the miracle is, he's let me feel that love. That's life changing. He wants to change your life with love. Some of you are in here today and the biggest struggle is either you love the wrong thing or you don't love the right things enough. Either you love the wrong things or you're not loving the right things. I said you're loving the wrong things or you're not loving the right things. It's all about love. That is the square root of victorious Christian living is what you're loving and how you're loving. I'm telling you, if i got a miracle like that, you can have one today too. You start loving the right things for the right reasons, it'll be so powerful. You know how you get there? It's you love yourself less. It starts there. Most sin is loving us more than anybody or anything else, loving us more than God. That was Satan's issue. He loved himself more than God that created him. That's the problem with the world. That's the problem with the church. We're loving the world more than we're loving him. And then we go to chapter 14. The beast worshipers are tormented in the presence of the Lamb. Now that's ironic. What a paradox. He was tormented in the eyes of the world. Now the world's going to be tormented in the eyes of the Lamb. A revelation of Jesus Christ. Things go around and they come around. Because he's got a plan. So that's in chapter 14. Then the song of the Lamb is sung. And it's message. This is the song of the Lamb. Listen to the message. It's to fear God. Now he's one. There was a time that he was willing to let the world do whatever. Now he is demanding they fear him. That means they respect him. And they glorify him. That's what the song, we will, we will fear you, Lord. We will glorify you, Lord. We will worship you. He wants fear. He wants glory. He wants worship. He wants us to understand there is judgment. That's, that's the fourth part of that song. It's because you are the righteous judge. He is a judger. We're going to get judged. The world judged him. The world's still judging Jesus. They're still trying to undermine him. They still see a, a, a weak, lowly lamb, but he is the judgment of God. That's the Savior revealed. There's going to be a war, and God is so cool, the way God works. Because the Antichrist is going to come in, and that's what the spirit of Antichrist is bolstering the prostitute, which is Babylon, building up the apostate church. The Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist. He's turning the world against the church. He's turning the compromised church against the church. That's how Babylon grows. And so this harlot, this Babylon, what it means is the harlot is this, the church is prostituting itself to the world. And that's what all this is about. So the church is prostituting itself. Jesus Christ is raising up his army in heaven. There's this army. But then there's the kings that have bought into the apostate church and the, and, the, and the wrong governments and the sinful way of thinking. And then at the end of days, Jesus is going to take the armies of Antichrist that he has deceived and raised up. And listen to what he's going to do. He's going to turn them against Babylon. Now they're working together. But God the righteous judge is going to sit back and he says, you know, sin will destroy sin. You know what? If, if, if people that are into drugs, uh, people in the mafia... You know, there's no respect, there's no love, there's no trust there. If, if you're in the mafia and just knowing a few people that and that's come across pen in my my life in ministry, uh, we know people. We're good friends with some people that are from some of these crime families. And the deal with them is this: the people you think are the closest to you, the ones that want to kill you the most. The, it's, it's not the the law or not the world that that you can distrust and have to to look over your shoulder. It's, it's those that you are in partnership with, that you are in league with. They're the ones, that, and that's, that's what ha happens in the end of days. The Antichrist, God will use them to destroy Babylon, and Jesus is going to destroy Antichrist and his armies. Isn't that cool? Jesus is revealed. All these things are going to come to an end. So I'm going to try to tie this down from this part. The Savior is revealed. But Jesus laid down... When he came, born in a major, he
he laid down to the powers of darkness so that he could give his life so that you and I could be saved. But he's not laying down anymore. That is chain. He stands up to them for you. Years ago, I was a young minister. I was a youth pastor. I was in Florida with him all the way to Atlanta to this big conference, big well-known pastor speaking. And I'm talking about the nature of Jesus, Jesus revealed. Because I said all these things to scare you. You know, conqueror. Of course, if you're a child of God, you don't have to be afraid. But when you read about judgments being dumped out and the description of what those things are going to look like, man, it can give a common man nightmares. It can tear you up. But I remember going to this conference because I want you to know righteous judge, many crowns conquer aside, he is a personal Savior that would do anything for his children. I would do anything for my kids and my grandkids. I'd do anything for you. I, I love you enough to do anything for you because you're my, you're my family in the Lord. And some of us have relationships where we're closer to one another than we are our blood family. Our relations, we, we trust one another more. But I remember this pastor saying he was in a difficult place in his life. He said, I just needed a sign. I needed somehow to know that God sat on the throne, that he loved me, had a plan for me, he was hearing me, and that he could affect this major thing going on in my life. And he said, I just looked up to the heavens and I cried out, and he said, I saw just a shower of shooting stars. And he said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, see, I'll move heaven and earth for you. And I thought, wow, would he ever move heaven and earth for me? And it was many years later. I went to a state park down in South Georgia. And I happened on to a spot. where the worst tornado at that time in Georgia history had come through. And it gave the path of it. And the Holy Spirit quickened me and he said, do you remember this storm? He said, you were in a double wide trailer on the district campgrounds. Trees fell all around, but not one hit that trailer. He said, I moved heaven and earth for you. And that same day, I was saying, Lord, you know, I, I would love to see. Because it's been, I was a kid, the last time I saw a fox squirrel. Now, how silly is that? How silly is it for a grown man to want to see a fox squirrel? But in my childhood, when we would go squirrel hunting or rabbit hunting, man, if you saw a fox squirrel, that was just the most awesome thing. They're, the, they're some of God's most beautiful creatures, and you hardly ever see them anymore. This generation doesn't even know what one is. And I said, Lord, you know, I would love to see a fox squirrel just someday. I'm just telling you, as I stand here within the hour, a fox squirrel just run out on a limb. I had not seen one in Sometime after that, we, some men from the church were out fishing. We're out on a big boat, 50 people on the boat. I'm standing on the bow. I said, Lord, I've lived in Florida most of my life. I was born and raised in Florida. Been out in the Gulf, been on, in the bays. I said, I've never seen a flying pig. I would love to see a flying pig. In church, I had never in all my years never seen a flying fish outside of book or on television. I was standing by myself. Everyone had taken that pill of Dramamine. And, and like I told the guys where they would get seasick, I said, take one before you go to bed and take one in the morning. So by noon, they were knocked out. I'm talking drooling on the tables, knocked out. <laughs> I was like the only one awake. So I was on the bow, and I looked down, and lo and behold, a flying fish come out of the water and flew for 30 feet in front of me. And the Lord said, I'll affect nature for you. I'm the God of nature. I'm the God of heaven and I'm the God of earth. 
So church, I want you to know today that that's the God we serve. He came as a lamb. Jeremy, you can come and, and play. He came as a lamb, meek and lowly. Because that was, his, that was the Father's will and that was his obedience. That wasn't his nature. That wasn't his nature. He did that willingly, but it wasn't his nature. Revelation, it's a revelation. His nature is not to lay down and die. His nature is to speak to the wind and make it stop. His nature is to speak to the waves and back them up. His nature is to take power over death, hell, and the grave. His nature is to speak to sickness. His nature is to pierce the darkness. His nature is to raise up dead men. That's his nature. And John the Revelator is revealing the nature. That is a revelation of Jesus Christ. All-powerful. And I think the coolest thing is when the end of all ends come, he's coming back to end it with you and I. That's his nature. To build up the church, to equip the church, and to fight with the church. Could you get your miracle today? If you would stand with me. If you're here and you, you don't know Jesus, you can come and, and, and we will pray with you. You just walk the aisles, come to this altar. This is cross connection. There's no shame here. It's, it's family here. You know, if, if uh, my family comes to my house sometimes, the grandkids and my stepson, uh, my stepson, my uh, son-in-law, <laughs> my stepson lives in California. He went, I'm kidding, I don't have a stepson. My son-in-law, my daughter-in-law, you know, the, they walk in the house, they feel at home, first place they go is the refrigerator. You know somebody feels at home when the first place they go is to get something to eat. Well, church, this is a refrigerator. When you want something to eat, you know, we're, we're, we're the kind of people, and it's in my next week's sermon, but we're, we're the kind, most of you will forget it. I can say it now, you won't remember next week, but <laughs> we're a generation that's it's hard to satisfy us. You know, you can eat and get full and not be satisfied. We say that all the time. Well, I'm full, but I really didn't hit the spot. That wasn't what I was craving. But in this refrigerator, everything satisfies. Everything restores. Everything brings strength. Everything heals. Everything nourishes. So I want you, when you come next Sunday to this place and you bring a friend with you, just tell them, my pastor's changed. He ain't like he used to be. He had a weight lifted off his spirit. And I can tell it. I can tell the way he's preaching, the way he's acting. I can tell the way he looks. See, God did a miracle for my pastor. And if he'll do a miracle for my pastor, a pastor, by the way, that admits he needs a miracle, that admits that I need God more today than ever, that I need his help, I need his strength. I need his deliverance just like you do. But that church cross connection, the family church, we leave the light on for you. And a refrigerator is always accessible. And if you'll come to partake of that pantry, partake of that refrigerator, partake of that blessing, you won't leave here like you can. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you for this. Thank you for this message today, God, that was for me. And Lord, I hope it touched others. I hope everybody's changed. I hope, Heavenly Father, that Cross Connection is finally able to enter into its place of spiritual prosperity. 
that we finally, Heavenly Father, got to the place where we really want more. We really want your presence. We believe that you're a miracle working God. We believe, God, that the gifts and all the good things are for us and people can come and really get satisfied. Lord, we know that there's a spirit of dissatisfaction people are dissatisfied in the world dissatisfaction is in the world it's a spirit thing not happy with leadership not happy with this we're not happy with that not happy with our marriage not happy with our kids not happy with our parents not happy with our church not happy with our government not we're just not happy not happy with our house not happy with our car not happy with our clothes not happy with our shoes just not happy not happy with the meal we just had. We just can't be satisfied. But in this place, it crosses connection. Dissatisfaction will go out the door. We're not going to let the spirit of dissatisfaction and disgruntledness interrupt, God, what you're going to do. People can get on board and they can enjoy the blessings and they can go further spiritually than they've ever been in their life. And that's why a lot of people run and a lot of people pull back is because they're afraid to go spiritual places they've never been before. But God, I don't want to be one of those. I want to go, I want all I can have. I want all I can have in Jesus' name. I don't want to drink 98% of the milk and put the carton back in the refrigerator for somebody else to empty out. I want that last ounce. So Father, love them, bless them, keep them. Let them come back next week expecting something gooder then than they got now and we'll give you honor for it in Jesus name Jeremy close out in a word of prayer God bless you let's pray Lord God we thank you Lord for this day we thank you Lord for your miracles we thank you God for bringing the dead things back to life in this God I pray Lord for those Lord in this building today God that you'll go with them you'll keep them safe Lord God God you'll ignite that passion that fire in us God to just go out and spread your word I thank you for everything, God. For it's the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, amen.